we're going to tackle localization today. Localization is hard, but we're going to try and demystify a few things. So let's start by looking back to the days before the App Store. When you had, uh, say you created a game, and in the game uh, you were the mayor of a city and, and you defended it from aliens. The game was, the way people bought games, they got them in boxes, they came with manuals, and it was up to the local distributor to localize that and make sure people had a good experience. Some apps and games even had um, a hotline that you could call and speak to a local person who would explain how to use the app. Today, things are different. Uh, users get the app and they're supposed to figure it out. Um, the App Store basically gave us this means of instant distribution. You upload the binary to iTunes Connect, you press a button, and, and the app is available everywhere, almost instantly, unless it's stuck processing. <laughs> and it's in 150 plus countries, which is crazy. And that gives us as developers, we have a lot of responsibility, and we have to meet the expectations of users to be able to use the apps and to see something that they understand from the local perspective. Apps that are localized uh, get better downloads, and you're much more likely to be featured by Apple if, if the app is localized worldwide. So how do we as developers often deal with this kind of issue? No one really likes localization that much, and, and generally it's something that we kind of leave to the end of the development process. And yeah, also we do this. Uh, we just put NS localized string on everything. Uh, if you haven't done localization before, NS localized string is this macro where you give it a key and it looks into a localizable strings file and fetches the translation and replaces it. This is the basic implementation of localized string. And yeah, it's really not enough, which is kind of the purpose of this talk. Um, I'm gonna give you some examples of where we need to do more, and some practical tips, which will come in these purple boxes, and of, of things that you can do to really improve localization in your code in Swift. And the way we're gonna do that is that we're gonna take this boarding pass and go on a small trip around the world to various places that do things a little differently. So we're actually gonna start with a problem many people in the audience would know, uh, and we're starting here in Paris. So, yes, Paris is very pretty. There's patisserie, there's charming people. <laughs> and, and there's a specific way of displaying currency. So, say if I have this amount of money in my pocket, three euros 50, the naive way to present that as a string will be to just print it out uh, as a float with a euro sign next to it. Uh, we'll get something like this. Three, uh, the string will be euro sign 3.50, and French users will expect 3,50 space euros. Um, it doesn't seem like a huge difference, but if you're writing a finance app or, or you have in-app purchases, that could really make a difference to the users who are using your app. So Apple have a tool, uh, NS number formatter, it's very powerful. You give it uh, a number style. So we have a currency style that we can give it. You give it the currency code, and it will automatically adjust your, uh, your currency to the, local, the way the local formatting is supposed to be. So we'll get the 3,50 space euro that, that the French audiences expect. And that's good. And this number formatter has other styles. So we can use it just to format decimals, percents. Uh, they have a spell out one that, that is pretty cool. Uh, in iOS 9, they introduced an ordinal uh, style, so you can have first, second, third, fourth, and uh, et cetera. And yeah, the tip is that you should really, if you're, if you're including a, a float or a double inside the string, always use an endless number formatter because the international variations of the formatting of decimals is, is huge. So yeah, our next stop on our, our global tour is Germany. Germany has Neuschen, Karivest, uh, Strollpetter, and, and long words. Uh, Germans are very fond of long words. This is uh, currently the longest word in the German language, and I'm not gonna read it out. But it's, it's something legal. Um, and yeah, these are actual screenshots. So what it tends to do, uh, German, is kind of really test your UI. Uh, and these are actual screenshots from iOS 7 when it was first launched. And you can see how the clock app uh, has some problems and the music app as well with German. And 
The way to account for that is something you can do even before you have a German translation to your app. So there's a trick. If you go in Xcode and try and edit the schemes, inside the run schemes, there's an option to change the language to a uh, double pseudo language, uh, which is kind of Apple's way of saying German. <laughs> um, and it doubles all the strings in your app. And you can really see how flexible your UI is and if your UI can handle it. So uh, yeah, the tip here is mock up UI by doubling all the strings. And, and use auto layout as much as possible, because it really helps for this kind of stuff. Our next stop is Turkey. Uh, Turkey's great. It has Turkish delight, Turkish coffee, wonderful things. And capitalization is, is slightly unusual in Turkey. So if we have a string uh, with the name of Turkey in Turkish, which is, this is how you spell it, and we want to have the uppercase version of it for um, a box or whatever, uh, this is what we would get just by doing uppercase string. And this is wrong, because turns out Turkish, uh, capital I in Turkish has a dot above it. And if you think about a Turkish user using your app and, and seeing the name of their country misspelled, that, that's pretty bad. Um, so yeah, from iOS 9, uh, this is Swift specific, I think. We have localized uppercase string, uh, which you can use, and it will uh, read the NS locale and correctly capitalize it. So there are, before that, we had uppercase string with locale, which was a bit more verbose, because you had to give it the uh, current locale every time. But that's available from iOS 6, so if you need to do, the, do that. Uh, yeah, there are three variations of this. We have uppercase string, lowercase string, and uh, capitalized string. And yeah, every time you want to capitalize a string, just go for the localized variation. Our next stop, we're going to Russia. Red Square, Russian Dolls, and Tolstoy. And yeah, plurals. Uh, so if we have a, if we're counting seconds, uh, usually in English, we have one second or two seconds. And this will be kind of the naive way of handling the string formatting for that. But that's wrong. So in Russian, there are actually three different variations on plurals. So you can have, if the, num if the number ends in one and it's not 11, and then if the number <laughs> is between, ends in two and four and it's not 12 to 14, and then everything else. And yeah, if we had the if statement, it'll become a bit more complicated here. Uh, and then you meet like Gaelic Irish, and it has five. And basically there are 16 different uh, plural systems around the world. And this was not handled in iOS until iOS 7, when Apple introduced Stringsdict. So Stringsdict is a plist file. Uh, it has the keys, just like NS localized strings, but they translate to uh, subkeys of, of one, of, uh, many others. And the variations are one, two, few, many, and other. And you just fill that in, and it will handle all the logic for you. So you still need to localize a string, and then you pass it to a localized string with format on string. And, and it, will, it will do all the formatting for you, and you don't need to handle all these different rules for different places. So yeah, use strings dicks for plurals every time. Next, we're going to Japan. Yes. So cherry blossoms, waves, Naruto. Uh, Japanese addresses. So, the way we structure addresses in the West is that we go from the most specific to the least specific. So for me, it'll be Roy Marmelstein, the stage, dot .swift, and slowly all, all the way to the postcode and the city and the country. In Japan, it's the reverse. So you start with uh, the least specific and you work your way down. It's important to note that this is only for like addresses in Japanese in Japan, because if you, they, you give them a Western address, they will still expect the Western way of, of doing it. Um, right, so how do we handle this? Uh, ten, for some reason, Apple put this inside the contacts framework. So there's a postal address formatted there. And yeah, you create a CN postal address, you fill it with the address that you want, and you pass it to a CN postal address formatter. And it will do the magic for you. Before that, it was in, in the address book framework, so you can use that as well. Um, yeah, so remember the address formatter is hidden in contacts, uh, and you should use it when displaying addresses. So this kind of weird rule uh, applies in China and Japan and South Korea. And now we're going to the US, and New York, and America, and Steve. And yeah, we're going to talk about distance and weights. <laughs> 
So uh, yeah, the Americans uh, have their inch, foot, yard, mile, ounce, and pound. And yeah, so for distance, uh, Apple kind of wants you to use MK distance formatter, which is hidden in MapKit. Um, so you create uh, your CL location distance, which is a double, and it takes the distance in meters. And you give it to uh, the MK distance formatter, and it will format it to the locale. There are some options on that, so you can change the locale and do, do exciting things. And yep, in the US, you'll get 350 feet. Good. Uh, for mass, well, there's the NS mass formatter, which was introduced in iOS 9. And it's kind of smart, so you can even tell it if it's for, if you're, you want the weight of a person versus the weight of a thing. And yeah, it knows, it knows how to handle your, your mass formatting. Yes, right, so distance formatter, hidden in MapKit, uh, form, uh, mass formatter can handle all the weights. So now we're coming back to France. Uh, this was a great trip. So, things we didn't get to discuss, uh, left to right, so this didn't really work on iOS very well until iOS 9, Apple did a lot of work on it. It's really quite complicated, so basically the entire UI gets reversed, and you think like interactive pop gestures need to go the other side, and there's a lot of stuff that you need to do. If you're just using UIKit, it should happen automatically, but if you're doing anything custom, you need to reverse your photos. Uh, th there's a lot of stuff to do for, for left to right, and it's, it's really complex. So things that are missing in general and, and localization, we don't really have a, a good system to deal, for dealing with gender, which French people will know. Now, the locales, usually the current locale goes, well, it goes to the locale defined in the settings of the phone. And that's not necessarily always what you want. So sometimes, if you're a French person in the US, you might want a different kind of uh, format. Or sometimes you want the format to be based on where the user is or, or what kind of network he's on. Uh, and we don't have a great way of dealing with that. Then there are some like miscellaneous differences. So Chinese names don't have initials. Uh, in French, people like to put a space before an exclamation point. And yeah, all of this, a lot of this is still, are still Objective-C framework, so there's, there's the NS prefix everywhere. And NS is not very swifty. So yeah, there are some frameworks. I built two, so I have format and localized Swift, and there's one that I really like uh, called SwiftGen. And they both try to find a more Swift-friendly approach. Uh, from my frameworks is more about the syntax. SwiftGen actually generates uh, enums for everything, which uh, is great, it's cool. So, uh, the big picture of this talk. Basically, over the last 10 years uh, or so, we've seen sort of the rise of test-driven development and people taking something that we used to do at the end of the process to the beginning and how that helps us write better, more testable code. And what I kind of want to argue for is a similar thing with localization, uh, localization-driven development. And you should really handle these problems from the start and it will save you a huge amount of headache later on. Uh, and yeah, and you will have better, happier users and, and a better world. So yeah, that's it. Thanks.